Facebook just filed for a mega IPO of up to $5 billion moments ago. Joining us now with their takes on one of the biggest and most anticipated IPOs in recent history in Raleigh, Brian Hamilton. He's co-founder and CEO of SageWorks and in San Francisco, Silicon Valley startup guru, Steve Blank. Welcome, gentlemen. Now, Brian, I want to start with you. Uh, Facebook, the numbers we're getting right now, says it earned $1 billion net on revenues of $3.7 billion last year. Advertising making up 85% of revenues. And reports had Facebook valued as high as $100 billion. Is it worth that much or is this overhyped? Yeah, it's a great question. So let's look at this company this way. They're growing, they're profitable, the margins are good, and they entirely own their space. That's terrific. But on the valuation side, these guys are going to be priced at about 100 times profits and probably between 18 and 25 times sales. So it's going to probably be a richly priced stock uh, if it comes out the way we think it will. How does it compare to Google when Google debuted, when you take those metrics of sales to value? It's a great question. Google came out at about nine times trailing revenue. So again, these guys uh, definitely have a very good opinion of themselves or the market, and they're coming out at a different time. There's no question about it. But the concern here is you've got a lot of early investors. It's really around the people coming in now, because as you know, the market tends to gravitate toward reasonable valuations over six months or 12 months. It's not to say it's a bad stock or a bad company, but it's definitely going to be priced a little bit on the high side. There's, to me, there's no question of that. Well, Steve, Brian was just talking about early investors. Do you think there's enough demand out there to ramp up beyond $5 billion? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think, um, you know, Facebook is the beginning of the social uh, networking explosion for investors. Uh, I think we're just seeing the beginning of uh, a, a trend that will just continue throughout this decade. Um, and Facebook is the bellwether company. Um, and I think the, the question for investors, are you buying early into Google or are you buying early into Groupon? Um, my instinct is it's more like paying, um, being overpriced for Google for the first couple months, but uh, I'd be rather owning that than, uh, than something else. Well, Steve, if it is overvalued, uh, are we seeing, and you're talking about explosion here of social media, are we seeing the start of an internet bubble after a series of other IPOs that we saw last year? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, for investors in Silicon Valley, the, uh, uh, the liquidity window has uh, been closed so long, uh, this is like getting out of prison. Um, you know, the last six months of 2011, and now Facebook is uh, potentially the opening of a liquidity window that you haven't seen in the last 10 years. And, and that's good because it tends to recycle uh, cash back into new investments on a scale that, uh, again, we haven't seen for a decade. And I think this is the b beginning of 21st century innovation and entrepreneurship in this country. And Brian, um, let me go back to you. How will Wall Street justify this valuation? There you see a picture of Mark uh, Zuckerberg, by the way, who uh, earned $1.49 million in pay last year, but will get a pay cut to a dollar a year effective January 13th. But, but Brian, how do you see Wall Street justifying this? Well, I mean, really, if you look at any traditional metrics, they can't really, I mean, remember, we don't know for sure, but if it's valued between 75 and 100 billion, it's going to be really hard to justify that. Going back to Steve's point, by the way, Steve, I agree with you. It's good for Silicon Valley. It's good for early investors. It might be good for entrepreneurs, but really, does that really matter? It's really the people coming in right now. And remember, the market does gravitate to reasonable valuations. These guys, if it comes out at this value, we don't know, but it looks like it's going to be, it's really rich and the market will definitely tend to gravitate toward a rational valuation at some point. And by the way, I know, Steve, that the tech companies, they get a little latitude, no question about it. You know, they're between four and 10 times trailing revenue. But you look at this company, can they continue to triple revenue to, to really justify that valuation? My view on that is, you know, who knows, uh, doubtful. Well, Steve, you're saying that you see more of it as on the Google side as opposed to Groupon side. So do you see them possibly building that business fast enough to satisfy the shareholders? Yeah, there's a couple numbers I'm, I'm kind of looking at. Uh, just I've seen the early ones just like you have. Uh, if I'm correct, I think their numbers were $3.7 billion in, uh, in earnings. Uh, $3.7 billion in revenue. In, in revenue. $1 billion in on earnings. On a customer base of $845 million. And if I do the math in my head, 
that's probably about four dollars a customer is that about right or four and a quarter and so if I also kind of divide it out I think about 85 percent of their revenue was from advertising and maybe another 12 or 15 percent from people like Zynga so now the really real question is can they get more revenue for advertisers or that it, can they can create other revenue streams from their current customer base? And can they grow their customer base? Well, one of the things we know is uh, Facebook is the first company to kind of run into the limits of the population of Earth, um, which is kind of a wonderful thing to have happen. But uh, I don't see them getting more than 3 billion customers, which might seem a little ludicrous, but they're already almost a third of the way there. So the question is, how do they grow from their advertising base to other market segments that will uh, help them generate revenue. And I think that's the question going forward. Now, now Steve, uh, we're reading here that uh, Facebook anticipated making capital expenditures in 2012 of approximately 1.6 to $1.8 billion. What do you see Facebook doing with the cash raised? Uh, I think there are some going to be some very lucky companies that are going to be the YouTube to uh, what YouTube was to Google that uh, Facebook probably has some acquisitions in mind. Uh, such uh, as? To actually help them generate uh, additional revenue. And those companies, who are the possible companies that uh, Facebook will scoop up with the money? And boy, if I knew, I'd be buying their shares today. What holes do you see them needing to fill? Well, I, I, I think I'll go back to um, uh, this is going to be a how do I generate more revenue per user. And I think uh, more games, maybe owning their own gaming companies, uh, um, uh, other things that uh, they find their user base might actually want to do. I can imagine them buying everything from Match.com to Monster.com, depending on verticals they want. And I, I truly don't understand their expansion strategy, but we will see the first inklings of this as soon as they have cash in the bank and or a tradable stock, which they're going to have uh, fairly shortly. Well, Steve, you mentioned it earlier, but Zynga makes up to 12% of uh, Facebook's overall revenue. Do you see Zynga possibly being a takeover target? Uh, sure, uh, it's, it's always possible. One could, though, imagine that uh, uh, Facebook might like to acquire and expand in um, adjacent segments uh, rather than uh, just owning Zynga, but uh, that's not out, of the, not out of the question. And Brian, I don't know if you know, we're going to see Zuckerberg uh, ditch his trademark hoodie for a, a suit uh, now that he's uh, be part of a public company, but is he up to the task of leading a public company, or should Facebook bring in a veteran the way Google did with Eric Schmidt? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, in American history, there are entrepreneurs that can run great public companies. There's Bill Gates, you know, there's been plenty of them. It's well documented. In fact, getting rid of the founders of a company can be very risky. So uh, going back to Steve's point, by the way, it's an excellent point. Um, they have a proven revenue model right now. It's working. The revenue is growing. But if they have to rely on some type of new business model or monetization of data, that's where the risk comes in with regard to the valuation. So I don't know if he'll be able to continue to grow the company, but I'm not really worried about what he wears. Uh, you know what I mean, Fred? He's, he's done very well. It's a strong company. They totally own their space. I agree with Steve, by the way. I think they're starting to bump up against that wall of possible users and the acquisition costs associated with that. But on the close end, uh, he can wear what he wants if he keeps growing the company. <laughs> As you talk about growing the company, we just saw this cross the wire that Facebook says it has near zero percent penetration of internet users in China, and that uh, as for Zuckerberg's stake, uh, he owns 28.4% of B shares, 36% of Class A shares. What do you make of his holdings? Um, the, uh, I, I think is that for, that's for me, Fred? The market in Silicon Valley is going to uh, jump 30% this year. The, is it going to jump 30%? Steve? Well, if, if you think about uh, what just happened to the net worth of uh, yeah. uh, four or 5,000 people in Silicon Valley who, who all now could possibly afford to buy things uh, that they never could before, I think uh, much like after the Google IPO, you're going to see a housing bubble yet again and a line at Porsche dealerships in Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, I think uh, the uh, California revenue is going to go up in a way that uh, probably the state budget didn't anticipate, and I'm <laughs> well, not being facetious. Well, Steve, I guess you're talking about the big, huge wealth effect in Silicon Valley. Uh, then, Brian, uh, what does Zuckerberg have to do to keep all these folks motivated and not walk away? Well, you know, talent acquisition is very important in any tech company. We know that. And as a matter of fact, it's interesting because you can't really equate talent acquisition with number of employees. Sometimes it's just a couple of great developers. 
Uh, they're going to have those cars like Steve talks about and the houses and all that other good stuff. Uh, generally, though, in a tech company, when you've got a lot of talented people, you're really challenging them, not necessarily through money, although money doesn't hurt, but it's really on the tasks ahead, what they're working on, and just keeping things interesting. And uh, Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of the company, certainly did well when she was at Google. Now she's at uh, uh, Facebook. What sort of uh, challenges do you see her facing? Brian, stay with you. Well, basically, to, yeah, basically to keep the culture intact. I mean, they've done a good job of growing the company. Uh, remember, you know, there's been great studies of tech companies around this uh, whole subject. It's very difficult to sustain growth of a company at over 100% a year. Uh, for an extended period of time. So really, the real challenge for them is going to be around culture, getting good people in there, uh, you know, uh, getting them on good assignments that are interesting, and obviously making sure they don't bump against that demand wall because, you know, there is a fixed population in the world, as Steve pointed out. And Brian, in case you're inter interested, uh, Sheryl Sandberg's salary was $300,000 last year, according to this IPO filing. Um, Steve, you know how to grow companies. You're a serial internet entrepreneur. Brian was talking about the importance of culture. What must Zuckerberg do to keep this company growing and, and hit those metrics that he'll need in order to satisfy Wall Street? Well, you know, I think in the Valley, the gold standard for a corporate culture for an innovative company is still Apple. Um, they had the benefit of, uh, you know, not only coming from behind, but seeing an enormous appreciation in their shares, both of which, uh, which kept a... Um, uh, a culture which was unbeatable for innovation and uh, continuing uh, growth. Um, on the other hand, uh, after Google's IPO and, and Facebook was founded, uh, Google actually lost uh, uh, a key number of employees to Facebook uh, because they started feeling like a large company. Um, and, and so this corporate culture of innovation uh, uh, really is part of the, the DNA of, of what makes a successful company or one feels like uh, you're working for a you know a large state company. Um, it's a problem Microsoft now faces. Yes. Um, and and, uh, I, I, and I just want to second something Brian said. If you look at who runs the largest technology companies, the largest ones used to be Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, um, and, and you could go on and on. Though most founders end up actually getting removed, but the largest ones are the ones with the founders who have figured out how to grow from the guys in the hoodies to guys who can manage or women who can manage tens or thousands of employees. And it's that rare breed that actually makes the winning companies. I tend to bet on the uh, IPOs where the founders are still in place. And the reason why is really critical, I think, for everybody to understand that technology companies are not just one innovation. They constantly have to reinvent themselves. And the people who are best capable of doing that are the people who are capable of vision and inspiration. And those tend to be the founders. As you mentioned, Steve uh, Jobs was kicked out of the company. Right. He came back to that company and resuscitated. Brian, let me go over to you. Advertising makes up 85% of Facebook's revenues currently. That's a high percentage. A lot of people say they've got to monetize in other ways. Is this sustainable, this current model? Yeah, we don't know yet. I mean, it's really a demand equation, right? We really don't know. And there's been some very well-documented uh, research on this right now. There are sort of un-Facebook people, right? I mean, there's people who just don't want to be on it. We don't know when that magic wall is going to hit, but we know it's there. So, um, you know, if you're going to invest in this company, if you're looking long run and you're looking at monetizing data or developing a different business model, you could be in a risky area right now. So we don't really know where that demand curve is, but there are people who just don't want to be involved with Facebook, and so uh, that's another risk to the investment. All right, Steve, so I guess they've got to walk a, a, a really fine line, right? So that they don't alienate the users, they try to boost the monetization of that site. Right, and, and uh, you know, I, I should just remind you is that advertising is a model that's been around, it's a two-sided market, right? You get uh, a ton of users, and then you sell access to the us users to advertisers, invented by newspapers, then radio, then television, uh, now the net, and Google being the best example of a two-sided market in, in, in the 21st century. 85% of Facebook's revenue comes from that two-sided get users, sell, ad sell advertisers. But the other interesting piece, it's the other 15% that they've become a platform. 
And so it's really possible that they might have a platform strategy for layering on another side of a market that traditionally doesn't exist in an advertising-based market. And I think that's going to be interesting to watch. Your other comment about the billion people in China not using Facebook, well, that's a potential market and potential user growth, uh, but there you have limitations on um, how much they'll conform to uh, uh, government regulations in China. And I think that'll r remain to be seen. Uh, Steve Blank, thanks a lot for joining us. And also, Brian Hamilton, thank you. Great to thank have you, Jerry, hearing your views on this historic day. I'm Fred Katayama. This is Reuters.